Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Mic Drop. I'm Arthur Brittany, and today we got a really special guest from the BBC, Shay Thompson. Give it up for her, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and on the other side, we got our usual guest, Larry. How are you doing, Larry? Hey, what's going on, Brittany? How are you doing? And hi, Shay, as well. Really, really great to have you here today. No, I'm happy. I'm happy and excited to talk about some video games. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Yes, our passion. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is really important. And that, that is why we are here today, because we came from different backgrounds, but we all got one thing in common is that we love video games. So Shay, can you talk to us a little bit about yourself and video games experience and how you get really engaged with this lifestyle, I would say, because it's not a hobby for us, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, it is not a hobby. I, at least I'm lucky and like proud enough to say that I'm making money off of this. My mom still doesn't understand <laughs> how or why, <laughs> but I am. Um, I'm a presenter and game journalist or gaming journalist rather. Um, yeah, I started in the industry about two years ago, uh, just like from doing stuff like making coffees and teas for a games media broadcast agency. Didn't know that those were a thing either. Um, like I've always been into games my entire life, but the professional side of it was so like, I guess like unapproachable. It was, it was this thing that I knew was maybe happening off, off in the distance, but didn't know how to broach it. Um, so I made like a, a couple of like really terrible YouTube videos and that got noticed by someone. And then it just ended up snowballing into what I'm doing now. Uh, I've got a BBC Sounds podcast, uh, Press X to Continue that I'm on um, every other week. And I've done stuff with McLaren and BAFTA and also Xbox as well. Oh, cool. amazing. amazing. That's quite a lot of stuff already, particularly within, you know, your, your, your two year reign, which is mm. incredible. Um, I guess I, I wanted to ask Shay, like how, what, what got you into, you know, gaming in the first place in terms of gaming culture? Could you perhaps like talk us through, take us through like, your, you know, your own history and relationship to, to gaming? Well, I mean, you're part of that history, Larry. Uh, I don't know if people are aware of this, but we're actually related. So, like, I've spent, you know, hours and hours watching him and uh, Lincoln, <laughs> like, my brother, like, playing video games. And just, I mean, I was never really good at them as a kid. But, like, I think what was what was really cool about it and very different to something like music or film or tv where you're a passive participant in that with mm -hmm. games you're an active participant in your fun sometimes that fun feels like work when you're grinding for something in a jrpg or like you know playing through stuff that you don't like or yeah just my job now which is yeah mm -hmm. a lot of the time playing through stuff that i don't like <laughs> um yeah, like the fact that you you are the architect of whether or not you have fun. I think that's like a really interesting concept to me. And mm. when I was growing up, like there were so many things that kind of grabbed my attention. I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to have an experience like this watching a TV or a movie, like playing Metal Gear Solid yeah. 2 for the first time. I sat mm -hmm. and played that in one sitting. And at the time I was like 10 or 11, like that blew my tiny little mind. I was like, yeah. oh my God, like engaging with politics and art and tech in this way was just like, nothing like i'd ever experienced and yeah i don't think i don't think there's another medium that does that really it's i've got to say it's so special and amazing to be to be talking especially with family that i've grown up with someone um someone else especially you know um talking to to a black woman who's who's had these experiences because i guess you know, in terms of my experience, of course, of like growing up and gaming and like you say, we're, you know, we're a part of each other's lives within that, right? Um, one thing isn't separate from the other in order for, you know, us kind of get, getting into gaming or where we have now. But um, I, I, I remember when, you know, we, we kind of like reconnected, you know, a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And like, you know, I found out that, you know, you are professionally doing the thing with gaming. And I was like, whoa, like this is mad. But I've got to admit, there was a part of me that kind of, I felt a bit like disappointed with myself because I felt like, gosh, like I wish, I wish if there were additional things that I could have perhaps like done when, you know, playing games with, with, with linking and remembering, you know, you were there and Shahida was there as well. Like, you know, that maybe to kind of like bring to the table uh, in, in a way that would, 
will continue to pique your interest. I mean, you know, look, you've, you've made your way, you've done your thing and, and, and here you are. But um, I guess like, you know, I can remember even at the time we were, we, me and Lincoln, we were so into like gaming, like, you know, we would play like day and night when it came mm. to like the holidays from school and stuff, right? Like we would, it was, everything was about the game. And, and yeah, I, I, I don't know, like maybe, maybe I am kind of like um, overthinking it or maybe being perhaps a bit emotional of it, but I wonder, gosh, like maybe there were, there were things that I could have done or said additionally. I mean, it, you know, we're at this place now, which is great and we can share that, but I guess, yeah, my question to you maybe is, you know, were there things perhaps where you felt like you had to create your own kind of like personal space and relationship in, in building or, or am I kind of overthinking this? I don't know. <laughs> no, because I think like whenever I think of memories of gaming, I, I do think of like Lincoln and you are there, like regardless mm-hmm. of whatever. I think mm-hmm. professionally I've had to kind of eke out my own space because Mm -hmm. there wasn't really one for me i mean because of obvious like social issues but also the fact that like games is a relatively young industry you know Mm -hmm. like my job job if you can call it that like didn't exist like even 10 years ago so like i i really had to kind of craft my very own bespoke uh space in this world as like as it regards to gaming so I don't, I know, I wouldn't feel bad about that at all, you know. And I think also the way that I engage in games is very, um, it's very different, I suppose. Um, where you and Lincoln played a lot of like platformers, I am horrific at like your Super Mario world. I'm just very bad at them. I like, I don't even know what I like. I, I like side scroll and beat ups. I like where I'm empowered as a player um, to cover up the fact that I'm really bad and like not very dexterous. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> stuff like first person shooters, like Overwatch I got into like uh-huh. for a, a hot minute. I got pretty good. And then I was like, I put it down for a couple of weeks and I was like, actually I'm really terrible oh, yeah. at this. So yeah. yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think I've just kind of found my own space and my own tastes. And that is thanks yeah. to you, you know? so i wouldn't feel bad about that no right back at you and like it's just it's it's great that we're able to share that now and even even professionally especially as well i think um i really do relate to you in 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 that feeling of like being in a space that you have to kind of carve as as your own Mm -hmm. um you know I, i i would say in terms of both of our trajectories you're directly within the industry whereas for me i'm still kind of you know within my um my trajectories as, as as an artist i involve gaming into what i do of mm-hmm. course you know it, it it becomes a part of some of the other uh, processes of writing for films that i make or you know sculpture installations things like that or even sound especially actually and i'm you know even at the moment working on um some research to create essentially a range of um mixtapes that culminate different uh sounds or soundtracks to different video games within history both historical and contemporaries which you know um hopefully i'll be able to open up at some point in time but um you you actually you did you um you uh did a session with a range of other industry types right kind of talking about um gaming in relation to uh you know soundtracks or music would you Mm. could you perhaps expand on that a bit because like this is something uh Brittany and I have been talking loads about about the interest of of music and how that shapes your experience of playing games absolutely yeah I mean it was a really cool session I've been meaning to try and find the VOD so I can send it over to you um because it was a great session um mm. with all the tech issues love doing remote <laughs> stuff but um essentially what it was is like the art of like music in games and you know music in video games like helps create such an atmospheric feeling for me it's like it's part and parcel of a lot of things even if the game isn't necessarily atmospheric like Mm -hmm. the streets of rage streets of rage soundtrack is something that's in my head like all the time and it's not necessarily because it like you know that it's a horror game it's like quite the opposite it's just that it it builds it feeds into what the game is trying to communicate to you and that you have you know a range of streets there are people fighting and that yeah it feeds into what you feel it's like okay now the music's gonna quiet down and then you have like the crescendo of like the boss music coming in and you're like okay i might potentially die here like it, it, it's all yeah. a part of like the narrative world building as it were and um yeah getting to talk to those composers and just seeing what their perspective of it was was brilliant um there was some businessy stuff that even Mm -hmm. like now i'm like i still 
don't really understand <laughs> but one question that I loved and it's very rare that I write a question I'm like oh that was so good but basically what it was is like all of those composers have a very specific signature mm. sound and mm. I wanted to know like how they were able to retain that while still having to create something within somebody else's vision mm. and they all obviously had very very insightful and interesting answers and mm. especially for like the kind of fledgling composers who were watching because mm-hmm. every like a lot of people are like kind of obsessed with making sure that they have this signature sound and mm. I think it was Enon Zer that said like don't worry about it that stuff yeah. kind of comes out naturally as you develop yeah. a love for your craft it you know yeah. it comes naturally and you, it's not something you necessarily have to worry about which I thought was endlessly interesting that is amazing that really is amazing to hear like even as somebody who you know makes music and sound works myself like to 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 hear about like other professionals who are like look like don't sweat that whole thing of like whether something sounds like you or whatever you sound like, what, what does that even mean? Right. It's, you know, it's, it's really kind of being um, absorbed of, of, of that culture and kind of uh, just, just having a good time with it. Right. Whilst learning, of course, and expanding. Um, were any of the other composers just out of, um, you know, curiosity, were, were any of them perhaps like not classically trained, for example, or people who, you know, didn't kind of, or did anyone like talk about, you know, uh learning without like music notation that kind of thing just just out of genuine interest uh, you know what i didn't ask that just because a question i tried to avoid especially with people who were quote unquote quite successful mm-hmm. i never asked like how they got there just because the que- the answer is always i was just lucky and unfortunately like the panel was just a bunch of white guys so <laughs> even triply so you know yeah. so um so no I, I didn't ask that and i'm not too sure i'm gonna mm. say i'm you know what it's this mm-hmm. is gonna sound really bad yeah. i actually don't think i think the majority of them probably aren't classically trained because mm-hmm. Enon Zer, like he said that the way he started composing for video games was mm-hmm. he was composing for like a power rangers cartoon and then somebody asked him do you want to make the soundtrack for fallout tactics and he was like yeah and then it just went from there. So I'm going to say no. And that is no shade. I'm, I, I promise. I realize <laughs> the of my tone, I have inferred some shade. I'm not being shady. That is literally what he said. So like, Amazing. yeah, Amazing. take from that what you will. Yeah. Uh, Brittany, was there anything that perhaps like piqued your interest? From- yeah. I, I, you know, I like some ideas that she bring it to the table um, Larry and I, we were discussing last time about the music on video games. And, you know, it's like sometimes I wish the live got like a soundtrack, you know, to be ready for a situation. To just imagine you're like in the middle of the street and suddenly you start to hear the Super Mario Race track, you know, <laughs> the one where you're with the penguin. You're like, oh my God, it's, it's time. It, it, I, I'm getting ready to run or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're like walking, just imagine if you are like walking on the street and, and you hear the Guardian uh, music from Breath of the Wild, I think you will have a mini heart attack. <laughs> that oh my God. <laughs> no, when, you're, when you're walking on Breath of the Wild, you hear the guardian music it's like oh my god what is it <laughs> yeah yeah no it's so true it's interesting that that you mentioned that as well because like it for me brings up the history of how i guess from the, the the point when um the legend of zelda games you know kind of came into the realm of 3d so you're thinking about ocarina of time i remember you know you're running across like hyrule field and like you know yeah. you hear the soundtrack and everything's okay and stuff and then the soundtrack would just completely switch on you when an enemy comes in mm. and it just kind of jumps in and focuses onto that you know and just kind of thinking about that alone what you know which you kind of like brought out Brittany, just kind of made me kind of laugh a little bit because i used to um you know talking to thinking about uh lincoln as as, as shay mentioned um our, our, our close relative you know i remember we would like make jokes about like the way the music would change and things like. it's just this really weird kind of in joke meme kind of behavior you know but yeah. it's just so incredible how gaming music can, can kind of do that and i would even argue like it, it it's cinematic even beyond um traditional cinema because mm. because it's self-aware it's aware of the environment it's aware of the situation and it really is kind of like evolving and it's not simply just for two hours it could be 20 hours it could be 100 hours it could you know it can be constant right so um 
yeah yeah just i don't know those things kind of came to mind and i'd argue like that kind that those kind of experiences will stay with you longer sometimes than like even Mm -hmm. like a film experience Mm -hmm. and i I think it's because of the time that you invest in those worlds like i mean i'll i'll play a mediocre game and i'll be like oh that was a pile of rubbish but then i'll still be talking about it and thinking about it whereas like if i watch a mediocre film like i that will just be like a drop in the bucket and i'm like back with all the other memories that i don't think of you know like because like the time spent is like so vastly different between the two absolutely (laughs) and you know the experience of being really immersed on video games because you're using more than one sense Mm. usually when you are watching a movie you're having two sense like you're hearing and you're listening mm-hmm. but you got more active your mind when you're playing video games because you need to be aware of what's going on mm-hmm. so it's more easy to build that memories when you hear a song on video games for example if i hear the the super mario sunshine song mm-hmm. when you don't have the jackpot i get frustrated immediately <laughs> but i hate those levels <laughs> you know it, it's just such a bad memory but for example uh, if, if I hear uh, the Saria song from uh, Ocarina of Time, mm-hmm. I will totally will start to dance. <laughs> you know, like the Nuria. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally, totally. I, I think one of my favorite songs is, um, is the Song of Storms. Oh, um, yeah. I just think that's, and I think they, that, that song carried on into Majora's Mask. It as did, well. like, yeah. I remember, I remember when I got Majora's Mask, like, um, I think it was the Christmas that it came out. So like what, 2000 or whatever. Like I w- it was just so, it was incredible to like come across that, that moment. Like, because that, that song in, in, in Ocarina of Time, like to me, it, it just felt like this, this track that's on the side. And it's not part of the, you know, the, the main kind of like, you know, soundtrack that you hear when you're riding through Hyrule and stuff. And so to hear it kind of like brought back, it's like, oh gosh, like this is really, this is beautiful, you know. Um, Speaking of soundtracks, I'm going to ask you both. Um, what 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 are what are some of your favorite video game soundtracks? Oh, um, I always have like prepared answers for these because I think <laughs> about soundtracks a lot. Uh, Yuzo Koshiro, baby, like Streets oh, of yeah. Rage, just mm-hmm. a classic. Um, it's on Spotify, and when it came out on Spotify, I was like, yes, I actually got a notification for it, which shows you how much I spent like searching for it. Um, so that's a great soundtrack. Really like it's. I guess like 16 bit like but like almost like 90s house it's it's just genius um the marvel versus capcom 2 soundtrack classic very good um i'd even say like all three of the uh street fighter threes so new generation second impact and third strike brilliant soundtracks um i know a lot of people like the last of us ones i think uh what's his name gustav santo alaya like i think he's really talented um and there are some songs that are very seminal for me especially in the second game but i'm like they're fine they're, they're, they're like background music for when i'm working Not particularly. well in my case uh, i'm a nintendo fanboy i only play <laughs> nintendo, nintendo video games <laughs> um so uh of course in that sense mine and they are all come from nintendo of course the super mario is a must especially the super mario 64 you know, uh, if I hear a song, I immediately got my memory to where is that. If I'm hearing the uh, the the snow mountain uh, song, I immediately think about snow. Mm-hmm. If I if I see the 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 Goombat, uh, song, which is the race one, I immediately think about race. So uh, that's one of my favorite. Also, Ocarina of Time. I played Ocarina of Time a thousand of times, and I cannot get over it. That I'm still praying for a port on the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> <laughs> so fingers crossed we got that. Um, and another one soundtrack that really, really, it's remarkable in my life is the Pokemon soundtrack. Oh, yeah. You know, the Pokemon soundtracks brings me a lot of memory. Yeah. But I will highlight, uh, especially uh, on the last Pokemon, Pokemon Sword and Shield, uh, the gym's leaders. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Oh my god, that's I mean, playing video games, I never felt really, really into something once I hear that song. You know, it's like it's it's like a constant beat the whole battle, but once mm. once you reach the final Pokemon, the, the, the crowd starts like to singing and screaming, and you really feel like you're in the middle of the stadium <laughs> with a, a thousands of people around you screaming because you're playing with the Pokemon. So it's like 
that feeling of the getting really into the the peak of the of the battle it's it's, it's like oh my gosh i, I cannot explain how how that feeling is just like you cannot get only can get it when you're playing that i love that that remix it's just like only uh, just amazing <laughs> <laughs> wow so cool um for me um I think one of the most important soundtracks for me in terms of my childhood is definitely uh, the Street Fighter 2 soundtrack. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when I think about like playing games both at home, but also I don't know, like going to see someone play at an arcade at like a kebab shop or whatnot, you know, with, you know, and obviously arcade cabinets, you know, pretty much, you know, they've yeah. died a death of sorts, yeah. right? Um, but I remember like whether that was going to a cab office or, or a kebab, like just hearing the um, the speakers kind of like pumping of like the background to a track, whether it's like, you know, Ryu's stage where you just like, mm. boom, bada, boom, bada, ba, boom, boom, yeah. you know, like it's just really, really kind of like um, quite special to me. And and again, like that, that was also a soundtrack that, um depending on how the battle was going for yourself or for the yeah. enemy right the music would switch up it would speed up or that kind of thing and i remember when when i when i was younger when i would play like when that kind of thing happened like i remember kind of feeling a bit like tense like mm. oh gosh like i got i got to block this i got to make sure i'm pulling the dragon punch get in there you know before yeah. before it's over or before the time runs out right you know so um the way that you know artists like yoko uh shimamura was able to uh kind of bring that into uh quite a, a limited kind of like chipset at the time mm -hmm. we're talking about you know this moment of like 16 bit gaming and so on um is just just in, uh, amazing um I want to jump on the thing that you mentioned about like, you know, there may be games that are not so good, but the soundtrack's really good, uh, Shay. Um, I was crafting one of my mixtapes yesterday and I was listening back through the, uh, the, the soundtrack for Altered Beast, which was a game. Oh, on, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Sega yeah, Mega yeah. Drive and came out in the arcade. <laughs> Again, it's a game that me and Lincoln played a lot. Yeah. But actually, and we even would make fun of it. Like, <laughs> it was so weird. <laughs> It it's really just you know it's just there's, there's there's very little you can you can do like it's a great idea you know yeah you, these guys that are kind of like brought back to life by zeus to save you know this this kind of like enchanted princess or whoever from this evil person who is sending through all these creatures and that but like it was just so limited and just it's so limited executed, yeah you know oh. but but but, the, but again, the soundtrack was so cool. Like you know, particularly the, the the sound when when you kind of like change into like the different beasts and things like that. It just felt like whoa! All right, we're on a journey. We're going through. Mm. We're going through. And then you know, it, it's it's weird though because yeah, the gameplay for me is is trash. But the you know the um <laughs> the soundtrack really special. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm trying to think of like similar things. I don't know. Maybe it's because I've played a lot of mediocre games and like nothing about them. Uh, <laughs> have like stood out there's like, like cyberpunk i oh my god okay. um wow. okay. there is not like not even the soundtrack is uh, like the curated kind of like mm -hmm. radio soundtracks are good mm -hmm. i guess there are like artists on there that i like but like the actual score i was just like oh, no. i was left feeling very underwhelmed so oh gosh mm -hmm. right so just just to, to to make clear to listeners uh cyberpunk 2077 is a game which uh, came out uh, just toward the end of last year 2020 uh, it was developed by uh, CD Projekt Red. And um, yeah, there's been quite a lot of uh, controversy, to say the least, Bruh. surrounding the game. Um, yeah, um, Brittany, Shay, do you want to talk about that? Wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to spoil the Shay, but that's why I only trust Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you know, the, the thing with... Uh, cyberpunk and all this drama around it's like you know you play with the community and mm -hmm. basically that's the stuff um they've been developing the game for over seven years mm -hmm. and you know they've been teasing and hyping the community for several years about this mm -hmm. game and also they've been also a lot of delays with this game which is not bad at all mm -hmm. because uh a delayed game can be good eventually but if you rush a game, yeah. that will be a mess totally 
which is what happened here <laughs> in this case. So uh, the thing is, uh, CD Projekt Red, they started to uh, tease the, the video game, but only in the new generation consoles. Mm -hmm. So what happened there is like, we didn't get any preview for the old gen. Mm -hmm. and when the game came out, it was totally broken and completely <sighs> unplayable on the old generation. And that became- They the won the new generation as well. I was playing it on PC. I like- <laughs> I was playing on PC. I played on PC, yeah. Oh, no. And it wasn't like, I, do you know, my, my entire experience of this game can be summed up by when I finished it, mm -hmm. I, I didn't complete all the side quests and it comes yeah, up with a little thing saying- but you did get to the end. I did get to the end, unfortunately, <laughs> and it says, oh, you know, you've completed Cyberpunk 2077. There's more stuff uh, for you to see in, um, in Night City. And then do you know what happened? I'm going to show you because I took a picture as I was like, I, I hate it here. This happened. I got a blue screen on my PC. <gasps> the whole thing, it shut my entire PC down. And I was like, well, that is it. I will never return to Night City. Thank you, CD Projekt Red. Um, <laughs> It was not good. Uh, like wow. I, for another project that I work on, we did an entire timeline of uh, mm -hmm. since the game was like announced and teased about yeah. seven or eight years ago. We did a timeline of like all the news stories that came out of it. It mm -hmm. goes much deeper. Like the the way that they interact with like gender expression and like yeah. a lot of the anti trans sentiment, not only from mm -hmm. the game itself, but the mm -hmm. de developers and their social media, and also it, like I'm not I'm not, definitely not tarring like the entire nation of Poland with a transphobic brush. But mm -hmm. if you understand a lot of the anti-LGBT uh, sentiment and how that feeds into the development of the game. I do think that's mm -hmm. really important. Um, yeah. I can like send a link to it. Um, yeah, please But do. I think that helps contextualize what this, or like, yeah, helps contextualize what this game is trying to say, which isn't a lot, but mm -hmm. also like, yeah, with the development woes, I think, you know, there, there's a big problem in the way that our games are created. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I've heard people say, oh, but it's the same thing for like film and TV. We spend a lot of hours, like, you know, working insane hours. That's not a good thing. And that's not a justification. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the, fact that, the fact that crunch is so prevalent is, is a massive issue. Mm -hmm. um, we should absolutely care about the labor that goes into making our games because we spend so long playing them. It was the fact that they made this pledge to say that we're not going to crunch and then ended up crunching anyway. Yeah. Delayed the game. It should have just come out like several years later. Oh, and then God. even as, as, as recent as yesterday, they threw their entire quality assurance team under the bus saying that the oh. bugs were their fault. It, it's wow. just a mess. It's, it's not wow. a good situation at all. And yeah. like, I do think it's important to have conversations about this and think about, you know, yeah. why, what, you know what goes into the meat that becomes the sausage that are these video games, you know? Of course. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Shay, would you mind perhaps just expanding on like the meaning of crunch? Just because obviously, again, you know, we're gamers, so we understand what sure, that means, yeah. but for those listening. So crunch essentially means that, you know, teams will regularly work 100 hour work weeks in order to get a game shipped, uh, like wow. basically made to then be released to the public. Mm -hmm. And we, it, crunch is an exclusive to CD Projekt Red. It's something, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you see like across the board, like, mm -hmm. At Rockstar, the people that make GTA and Red Dead Redemption, at uh, Naughty Dog, who made uh, Crash Bandicoot, Uncharted, and The Last of Us, you know, it's it's something that we see especially in AAA titles. AAA being like the big budget video games, the ones that we like previously mentioned. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, who wants to work 100 hour work weeks? Nobody like, you know, we're advocating for something a lot lower than that. Like, you know, and, and, that, and that's not an unreasonable ask, but it's constantly, as I said, it's widespread in the games industry. It's, it's pretty bad for it. You know, yeah. That's yeah, no, please go, go for it. Yeah. No, that's what I'm loving. Uh, something Nintendo has been doing uh, during this couple of months you know they are they are not announcing video games until they are finished mm -hmm. you no know, that's why we got like the surprise release of age of calamity no one was expecting mm -hmm. no one hear any rumor everyone was talking about Breath of the wild 2 is coming and suddenly nintendo say i got you this for you <laughs> and we were like what um so people is like hype it and they are asking for a nintendo direct, direct. So, so to see what's going on, what's coming, what are you planning, Nintendo? But I think Nintendo has been wise in that sense mm -hmm. uh, to not say, you know, we're not going to have a, a, a release date for anything. We're going to tell you once it's finished. And yeah. I would say that would be something wise in the case of uh, Cyberpunk. Yeah. Uh, because at the, at, the, at the beginning, they set one date and they changed it 
to mm -hmm. another date mm -hmm. and they delayed the, the release date like for like three times but it was obvious they gave need at least six seven eight months more a year months. i say yeah, yeah, I would, maybe even yeah, two. I, yeah 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 so it will be wiser and everyone should understand the actual context of a pandemic mm. and everyone working from home it's naturally if, if you don't have any something ready you can mm -hmm. delay that yeah it, it's, it's totally reasonable yeah. so in that sense i mean it's it's things really has to be done things yeah. has to be done, but it will be more more wise to not give a release date until they finish and say you know what it's coming next month get your yeah. coins ready <laughs> no, indeed. It, it's really disappointing and, and even for me as somebody who who's played um some of cd projects games in fact i played um uh, which are free in order to the expansions on the uh, on on the Nintendo Switch. I I absolutely loved it. Um, again, it. funny 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 <laughs> thing with that actually, because you know you have a camp of people who are like really Witcher fans and mm -hmm. who love Zelda. But like um, the funny thing that I found even when I was playing that game was actually the amounts of bugs that I came across as well. Like you know even like game crippling bugs where the mm -hmm. game would just shut down. I'd lost stuff that I'd been working on over 10, 20 minutes, etc. But a lot of things should have worked and they didn't work or I knew I would put in an input and it just wasn't happening. And we're talking about a game that was criti it's critically acclaimed. It, it got so many awards and so on, right? Um, and then also the other thing as well that, you know, CD projects, of course, history-wise, like they, 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 they started out as a really small company, you know, um, whom were really against a lot of like the typical uh, types of things that happen within the gaming industry, including crunch hours mm -hmm. and things like that, right? They would speak out about that. It's quite ironic, right? That that same company would then uh, kind of like fall victim to their own words, like a kind of like, you know, prophecy kind of like told through what I'm going to just put out there and say is greed. They wanted yeah. to release a game for Christmas, which is, you know, the, the best period of time to, you know, to, to sell your console or software. And they, the, you know, obviously the higher ups, they made those decisions um, against perhaps any potential advice they likely received. Because, I mean, who in a development team would want to see a game go out that is just not ready? Yeah, and just not ready and yeah, not in a state to be played on, mm. on the vast majority of platforms. I think as as much as I, I have been quite negative about the game, obviously <laughs> there are several hundred people working on this title and to have mm. their work yeah. so thoroughly lambasted mm. on the internet, I think it just sucks. Yeah. Like it just it's just it just sucks like big mm. time. Um and yeah, like it, it's really interesting. Like I said in the timeline video that we did about uh Cyberpunk's history, like I like a lot of their almost like radical roots i had no idea about mm. um because like they're, they're quite like anti-piracy they've done yeah. a lot of strides they've made a lot of strides mm -hmm. um because like gaming and piracy there's a there's a very big kind of storied history there um so they've done they've done a lot of really cool stuff and to see them stray so far from their initially radical roots is it's a real shame especially mm. considering the fact that you know the witcher was this widely acclaimed it's it's like in a lot of ways regarded as like one of the best games of all time, The Witcher 3, I mean, mm. and then obviously, you know, there was the Netflix show, like it, it's yeah, done yeah. bits, but yeah. yeah, this has not been. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, would you like to explain for those that are listening what you were just gesturing towards? Yes, I got the Henry Cavill's pictures <laughs> back of me and I just pointed because we were talking Beautiful. about The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> And with glasses as well. So yeah. That's really, really cool. Well, that's, I found it on a magazine, so it's the biggest I could get it for free. So don't blame me. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. In a way, we've kind of, like, I guess, kind of reviewed or you've given us, you know, a review, Shay, of, of, of Cyberpunk. Um, there was a game we wanted to to talk to you about as well uh, uh Brittany um which I know Shay you 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 never got to to play over the Christmas because of you know the Christmas period for those of us as gamers is, is that point in time where you pick a game or two and you just get into it right you just focus and um unfortunately yeah. mine was cyberpunk so <laughs> oh gosh I feel for you I really feel, honestly I really I said <laughs> there is nothing worse than having that point in time in the year when everything shuts down and you, you make the wrong choice of game, you know, you, you put your heart or your soul or your trust into the thing and then it just doesn't 
doesn't deliver. Can I just be really obnoxious for a second? I did not choose. I was like, okay. <laughs> I had to play it for work. That was what it was. Because I, okay. I have so many other cool games that I was just like, I, I really want to like sink my teeth into these. Yeah. And I was like, no, you need to play Cyberpunk. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Oh, and just, sorry, because I, I don't, I feel like I've been very <laughs> negative without actually saying anything critical <laughs> about it. <laughs> my, the problem is, is that the game is, I mean, aside from all the bugs, because a lot of that <laughs> stuff is incidental. I don't, yeah mechanics yeah. but like it's a game first of all that like looks and feels like it was made seven years ago which makes sense given the development mm-hmm. time it it doesn't innovate on anything it has mm-hmm. it's very indulgent with absolutely nothing to say it, it flirts with the ideas of like you know anti-capitalism and you know gender expression and um even like sex work but then doesn't commit fully to yeah. actually saying anything profound about those things so then it ends up being this this weird thing where like even your your character that you're playing as is this weird centrist when it comes to you know engaging with certain issues which is so unbelievably frustrating to play as mm-hmm. and and then yeah like i said has nothing interesting to say and it's just not that interesting to play like it's it's a weird gta clone that had it come out in like 2013 when saints Mm. row 3 came out Mm -hmm. i wouldn't have blinked twice i I probably wouldn't have even picked it up had i not been you know (laughs) congratulatory obligated to i would have the whole time i was like i'd I'd rather be playing saints row 3 because at least that engages with its own law in a much more interesting and meaningful way and also it doesn't take itself too seriously no 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 it knows what it's saying and yeah but yeah 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 um yeah uh anyway you know moving on (laughs) um before we do go i wanted to ask uh shay uh one more question i guess you know where we've kind of spoken critically particularly about a game like you know cyberpunk and 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 some of the problems with certain types of tropes within the other the the gaming industry are there things that i guess you know for you that you know you've come across that you you are either trying to challenge or would like to see changed within within the industry this is a very interesting question because if you'd asked me like a year ago i would have said um you know i want to make sure that you know we have fair representation across the mm-hmm. board but i think it goes a little bit more than that because i think when people think and talk about representation they i think they just mean like not even just within games i mean like within like gaming positions like in mm-hmm. the industry i think they just mean like taking white people from those positions and putting people of color or other mm-hmm. marginalized people involved uh, at the top and i'm just i don't that's not the answer either mm-hmm. like all roads kind of lead back to capitalism, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and fighting that and making Mm -hmm. sure that doesn't just bleed through everything that we do. If we're thinking about, you know, always making sure our pockets aligned, then Mm -hmm. the result is very hollow work across the board. And I think that's a lot of that is happening. People are like, Oh God, the BLM protests, let's, let's try and find the closest black person we can find. And I'm like, I like, that's not, that's not what I'm here to fulfill. And that's not also the response and that shouldn't be what we do, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's just realizing that actually money isn't how we should be operating or like having money at the forefront of our minds isn't how we should be operating. Like, mm-hmm. you know, crunch, for example, we, we shouldn't yeah. be try like it shouldn't be a race to the bottom to try and get a game out because it coincides with the holiday period. It should be, no, let's, let's take the time to craft this story and this experience because that's what we want to communicate to players and then have it come out whenever it's supposed to let's have you know these diverse voices talk about this game because you know because having diverse voices and perspectives is really important to increasing diversity of thought you know um yeah i don't know if that makes any sense but oh no it does it does i mean even like i i remember reading somewhere i don't remember the 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 article per se but just finding out i mean it you know it makes sense anyway but the fact that you know there are way more people of color for example that play uh video games than than white people do and then also the amount of uh women who play video games is pretty much like half and Mm -hmm. half in relation to, to men yet that kind of aspects of representation whether that's through the story whether that's through the depth of conversation or you know just just you know unique kind of perhaps like insight and you know again kind of jumping on what you spoke about with um uh cyberpunk which feels to me like they basically didn't they didn't do enough of the research they needed to there wasn't enough consultation that was you know that was really kind of like jumped on and so on um 
that these kinds of things are, are you know really really are important and especially if you know as as, as you know the, the the game makers the ones who are who are putting out those games you know it, it's almost as if perhaps like the fans need to really be considered of even even more really within this environment that is quite diverse in that respect it's just within i guess from obviously i'm, I'm trying to gather from what you're saying like that there are there are problems within the industry that really need to be ironed out and like you say money money isn't quite simply going to be the uh, the way that it's going to happen yeah no exactly that we pretty much like nailed it on the head cool well my gosh um i feel like i could talk to you both forever like with games and you know hopefully we'll we'll have you know more chances like to to, to do this um it was really really exciting talking to you shay thank you so much for for coming along as always, Brittany, really lovely talking to you. My name's Larry Achampong, and this is another episode of The Mic Drop.